Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your unfailing love. We ask you to teach us the things that we ought to know that will strengthen our faith, that will teach us the things that um, will not just save us, God, but continually sanctify us and continually keep us strong in serving you. We need you, God. So bless us today with your spirit that the information would go right down to the, the foundation of our faith, build upon the foundation of our faith, we need you, and we're, we're not afraid to say we need you, and we don't know nothing without you, God. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. So if you've been with us for any... Um, you going to start now? Because I will come back there. No, you're good, bro. You're good. If, unless he gets crazy, don't worry about it. I mean, that little bit I'm not worried about. Just if he starts speaking out of turn, that's all. <laughs> We don't have, right, if he speaks in tongues and we don't have an interpreter, he's out of here. So if you guys have been with us, the book of 1 Corinthians is an interesting book. It's a, it's a very corrective book. And so far we've watched uh, the Apostle Paul, there's this messed up church. One of the first churches, the church in Corinth, this big city church, and, and they just got all these things all wrong, and he's trying to correct them. Well, you don't, you don't. Do clicks. We don't do clicks in the church, and there's groups of people who do this, and then they're getting together and they're messing up communion. All these things that he's had to correct. But it's almost like at, at the beginning of chapter 15, it's like the apostle takes a big breath and goes, Okay, now the big one. We have to deal with the big one. Now, fancy word, today we're going to deal in what's called doctrine. Doctrine's usually the one that gets the most yawns per service. So I'll expect it, and I won't feel bad about it. But it's also the one, if you're willing to receive it, you could hold on to forever and never be broken. Because if you don't have a solid foundation of what it is that you believe, if, you could, if, you, if you're new to church, you could look around here, and, go, and I said to you, well, how many guys went to a church and they never spoke in tongues, or they, they never prophesied, and so many guys would raise your oh, yeah, I'm from a Presbyterian or Southern Baptist or Catholic. Or how many of you guys are from more charismatic, and people did it in the middle of the service, and they screamed out loud, yeah, yeah, come in. That's because your foundation wasn't set properly. That's because you did things that the scripture did not say so, but man ordained for one purpose and one purpose only, and that's to bring more people in the church. Our church, and when I say our church, I don't mean Calvary Chapel, Different Beach, the church of Christ. Our church is not based upon the numbers of people. We praise God that there's churches that have tens of thousands of people if they're teaching the word of God without apology. We praise God that there's churches, listen, I want you to know something. We have a large church. Now, you might not realize that because we have Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale, and they got 20,000, and they got Church by the Glades, and they got 20,000, or you got all these new name churches, you know, like Proclaim and, and, and Disdain and whatever names they call them. Probably not a church named Disdain. Although in heaven it might be called Disdain, right? No, no, no. When it comes to just the regular church in the regular neighborhood, the average church is 35 people. A church with more than 50 people, it's like, oh my goodness, you got some church. So what do we got? 75, 80 people here? Maybe more? That's like, we got a big church. And I'm honored that we have a big church, that you guys would come here thinking that I can teach you guys something about the Bible. That's all I ever dreamed of. So I believe that we are successful because of that. But I will never, under any circumstances, cease to give you the full counsel of God's word. And whether, whether I get in three yawns per person per service, or today, like today, is probably going to be about a six or seven yawn per person per... That's okay. Here's the word of God, and here's what the word of God says. And this is super important stuff, because this is what's going to keep you going in the long run. Because, guys, whether you know this or not, the water's going to rise. The temptations are going to come. The fire's going to burn. You can have a job that tells you, oh, man, you can make more money, but you got to go to work on Sunday. You're going to, have a, 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 you're going to meet a, a, a dude that's going to tell you, oh, baby, I love you, but, uh, you know, that church thing, that ain't for me. You know what I mean? Or, or vice versa, whatever it is. You're going to have somebody who, you're going to have something, God's going to allow something to happen in your life. Some of you guys are going to lose a child. Some of you guys are going to lose a spouse. And you're going to look at God and you're going to go, I don't understand this, God. This don't make no sense. 
This don't make no sense. And if you have the foundation set, you'll be able to make sense of it. And you will be able to say, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But it starts today with the foundation. Chapter 15, the book of 1 Corinthians. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand. Please, again, just ex explanation. It's a corrective epistle. He is correcting their faults and he's telling them, moreover, more important than the other things that I've helped you guys deal with, let me help you deal with this now. The gospel. We know it's an old thing. The, the word gospel means good news. Well, what is the good news? The good news is the foundation of what you believe and why you believe it. That's literally the word doctrine. What you believe, why you believe it. I proclaim to you the gospel, he said which you receive from me and which you stand in. Verse 2, by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Now, extremely important, the first doctrinal thing that we deal with here, the first problem we have is what we just read absolutely obliterates anything that we've ever read about once saved, always saved, and you can do whatever you want after that. <gasps> Did he just say you can lose your salvation? No, the apostle just said it. If you don't continue to believe in the gospel, I don't know if you were ever saved to begin with. Now, at what point do you actually receive salvation? Is it when you first believe? Is it at? I don't know. Here's what I know, that you must continue in the faith believing. Believing what? Here's what's happening in the church. Now, focus in. This is the foundation of what we're going through today. There were these people called Sadducees. Sadducees were religious leaders who didn't believe in miracles. You had the liberal thinkers of the day who crept into the church. What was happening is people were coming to faith in Christ and they were not abandoning their roots. So important. I come from an Italian-American upbringing. I come from a Catholic background. In Christ, it means nothing to me. I'm not Catholic anymore. I'm not Italian anymore. I'm not a New Yorker anymore. I'm nothing. I'm a Christian. I'm a citizen of heaven. Everything I believe is contained here in the Bible. That's it. Everything else, gone. Done. I don't believe it. I don't do it. I don't follow it. Done. It took a lot of time for me to abandon those things. And it's super important. I don't care whether you come from a black culture. Yo, that's not the way we do things around here. Or Hispanic culture. This is what we do. You know, I don't care what it is and what accent I can pull out. You must find yourself leaving it all and following Christ. The problem in the Corinthian church is they did not do that. And these Sadducees who did not believe in miracles, who did not believe in angels, who did not believe in, ready, the resurrection of Christ. He was saying there is no resurrection of the body. Not when I say he, I mean the Sadducees, the people of the church. The Apostle Paul was starting to correct them. Listen. There is a bad doctrine going around that's saying there is no resurrection. This is important. Now, people always say, hey, maybe I think I might have um, committed the ultimate sin. People always come to me and they say, yeah, if I go to your church, I'm going to get set on fire. I have, to commit, I, have to, I have to know, did I commit the sin that will stop me from going. You know, usually it's, it's women who have committed abortions or men who have done. You know, I could go through the list of sins. Listen, none of that stop. None of that stuff stops you from going to heaven. Nothing. There's one thing that stops you from going to heaven. If you don't believe in, you ready? Romans 10, 9. You could write it down if you want, if you don't know it. For if you believe in your heart that God raised Christ from the dead and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. You cannot be saved if you don't do those things. Now, remember what I said? 
Here now we go back to the destruction of a certain doctrine. There's a doctrine in some of the churches, the Presbyterian and some of the, the Baptist sects, that, that's called Calvinism. They believe that once your name is on the list from the foundation of the world, it doesn't matter what you do. You can't resist it. You can't stop it. You can literally do anything you want to do. The tulip theory, it's called. T-U-L-I-P. It's an acrostic thing. I'm not even going to waste my time getting into it now. This obliterates it because it uses one word. If. What do you mean, if? If you believe would assume that you have some part in your salvation. According to Calvinists, you have no part in your salvation. Now, there is definitely logistical, biblical understanding that you cannot come to the Lord unless he calls you. Absolutely. He did not, you did not love him first. He loved you first. Absolutely. I see where they get it from. But here he says, if you continue in disbelief, in disbelief you're not going to go to heaven. You're not going to be saved if you don't believe in the resurrection. Why? Good question. We're going to answer it. I hope I've laid a foundation. If any of you all have questions as we're going, please don't be afraid to ask about this subject. Verse 3. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now, He's telling them, I only gave you what I got from God. What is the first thing I got from God? That Christ died for our sins, just like the Bible says. Now, I want to throw you a little curveball. Where does it say that in the Bible? Well, it says it in the book of Ephesians. It says in the book of Colossians. Uh-uh. It wasn't written yet. What do you mean it wasn't written yet? The Apostle Paul wrote this before he wrote those other epistles. So those things weren't written yet. So where was it in? It was in the Old Testament. What are you talking about? What are you talking about, Willis? <laughs> in the Old Testament, it talks about Christ dying for our sins. Where does it talk about that? Well, if you've never read Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And why are you so far from helping me? My, the, write it down. Read it later. It is the perfect description of Christ on the cross. When you read Psalm 22, you think it was written after the crucifixion. It's so intense. He even, the, the guy that wrote it was, the king, was King David. He even says, they pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones Old Testament, and that's how he witnessed. Imagine, I want, you to, I want you to think for a second, you all that are here. If I took away from your memory the New Testament, can you share Christ with somebody? Can you share the love of God without the New Testament? I hope so. And if you say to yourself, man, I don't know if I can, it's time to start reading the Old Testament and get into it hard. If you've not read... Chapter 52, starting in verse 12, and all of chapter 53 in the book of Isaiah. Man, he was pierced for our iniquity. He died for our sins. He was crushed. He was bruised for our transgressions. You read this and you don't realize that is 700 years before Christ's birth. And you're like, how does that say that? Because the word of God is powerful. The word of God is prophetic. The word of God is love for salvation. Are you with me? He goes to them. He preaches the Old Testament, telling them the coming king. And then he says, do you know what happened in Jerusalem just 15 years ago? Do you know what happened when they pierced this guy, when they nailed him to the cross? That's who they were talking about. I hope you guys are with me. Continuing, he says in verse 4, and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Wait a second. You're going to tell me that the Bible talks about him raising from the dead in the Old Testament? Okay. I'm glad you don't believe me. Turn to this 22nd chapter of the book of Genesis. The very first book in the Bible. We're just going to run through this a little bit. And to think about being a Jew... I thought about this. One of the things I was thinking about in preparation for this study was 
How do you use the Bible to tell somebody about Christ? Don't they have to first believe in it? Like if I use something that has no validity in somebody's heart in the first place as a way to get them, see, I'm getting the yawns now, I'm loving it. I told you it was going to be a six or seven yawn service. And I'm going to get double yawns in a little while. And here's where I'll get people like this. I'm not yawning. <laughs> Listen, I've been doing this for almost 20 years. It's okay. It's okay. If you're using something that people don't have faith in as a veracity for why they should believe, it makes it difficult. That's why the Bible clearly says it's the power of your testimony. Hey, you know what? You might not believe in the Bible. I understand that. I can, I can give you chapter and verse, especially to the Jew. But most Jews don't believe in their own Bible anyway. But how about this? You believe God changed my life? You believe he rescued my marriage? You believe he pulled me out of a prison cell? You believe, do you believe, do you believe? We overcome the enemy with the blood of the Lamb and the power of our testimony. Amen to that one? Continue, verse 1, chapter 22. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. The first little weird thing we have here is, was Isaac Abraham's only son? Then why did he use that phraseology? He's starting to do something. Even 2,000 plus years, 3,000 almost years before Christ's birth. You guys know John 3.16? Yeah. What does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? Continuing. Whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountain of which I shall tell you. He says, I want you to pack up your kid that you love, your only son. That's not my only son yet, but I'm going to say that anyway. And I want you to go to the land of Moriah. And in Moriah, if you've ever been to Israel, there's a bunch of mountaintops. Now, we're going to leave a little bit to the imagination, but guess which mountain he does this on. Hold that thought. Continue. Verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. Now, some would say it might be a stretch. There were three men crucified, one on either side, one in the middle. There's three. And he split the wood for the burnt offering, arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw a place afar off. And Abraham said to the young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. Now, wait a second. How does Abraham know he's coming back? God told Abraham to go and sacrifice, literally to kill his son and give him up to God. To some of you guys, you're like, that's as weird as it gets, dude. God's asking you to sacrifice your kid. That's weird. It would be weird if it wasn't extremely important for the very purpose of knowing Christ. Hindsight being 2020, every single person that read this or heard this story between then and the time that Christ died said, that's weird. But after Christ, it's not weird. It's like, it's complete foreshadowing. That's crazy. Why did God do that? Because he wants you to love his son and he wants you to have proof that the things that he promised are coming to pass right before your very eyes. Right before your very eyes. As a matter of fact, I think it was the book of Hebrews where he said that uh, the reason Abraham said that because he knew even if he killed his son that he, he, he can raise him right from the dead right there wasn't even a question to Abraham. Abraham had seen so many miracles at this point. And I think that's a really important thing for us seasoned saints. If you've been walking with the Lord more than 20 years, there's a kind of yawn that happens within your own. You're kind of seeing enough. Now, do those seeing enough create a hunger in you or a malaise? 
Or is it like, yeah, well, I've seen it all. Man, I, I, I wanted to create a fire in my heart. I don't want to tell you what God did 20 years ago. I want to tell you what God's doing today. God's doing crazy things today. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, took the fire in his hand and the knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father? Who else said my father? Do you know there was only one time the Lord Jesus didn't refer to God as father? Does anybody know when that is? Does anybody remember that? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The same thing quoted in Psalm 22, the same thing that he said he, he reasoned with them from the scripture, the same exact thing that we're seeing here. Isaac says, my father. But the only time the Lord Jesus didn't call him his father was when God had to turn his back on the cross. It's just, there's too many coincidences here not to say this is a setup. And he said, here I am, my son. And then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? See, Isaac didn't know what was going on yet. That had to be a very uncomfortable walk. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Now, I have to give you, you who think that the Bible is full of error and contradiction, I'm going to have to agree with you on something. We just found one of the errors in the Bible. I want you to look at that line we just read. Verse 8 says, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. You see the word there in between provide and himself, the word for? That does not exist in any of the manuscripts. Now, why is that important? It's not just important, it's everything. Read it now without the for. My son, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering. God himself was the lamb. The father provided himself in the form of Jesus Christ. I don't want to get too close to the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, how they're all one. Let's save that for another doctrinal teaching. God will provide himself. To the Jew reading this, they're like, oi vey, what is he talking about? What is he, Meshuggah? But let me tell you, this is so crazy given what we're looking at. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there, placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac, his son, laid him on the altar upon the wood, and Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Now, we can continue to reading and say, but the very mountain that he was about to sacrifice Isaac on, that he did not, is Golgotha. The very mountain where God's son was provided for Isaac our sacrifice. He reasoned with them through the scriptures. He went to this town in Corinth and he said, listen, what saved you was the knowledge that Christ died for your sins and the belief that God raised him from the dead. The knowledge and the belief working hand in hand, very much a verb not a passive restraint or anything like that. Now, real quick, before we go back, look at verse 11. You see where it says the angel of the Lord? And you notice that the angel, the word angel, is capitalized. 
the angel of the Lord, that very word appears about a half a dozen, ten times in the Old Testament. It's not an angel, small a, it's the angel, referring to Christ Jesus himself. Christ reaches down and he grabs Abraham's hand and he says, I will do this myself in about 3,000 years. Do not harm the boy. So reminds me of the Lord Jesus' hand upon Peter. Peter, put your sword away. Don't you think I can... Just the pictures here, they flow so amazingly. In your brain, when you know these things, listen, I encourage you, if you are really uneducated in your Old Testament, immediately, immediately, immediately start reading it and study it. Study it with a, a, a Chuck Missler, a Chuck Smith, a uh, John Corson, some, some, somebody that you can read, and so, my goodness, that is the most amazing foreshadowing I've ever seen. Back, please, to 1 Corinthians. Here's where we get into a little bit faster gear. Verse 5, And that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve, after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James and by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. Please, what he's telling them, he's writing this letter, and although we've already taken a long time to say, he says, listen, guys, I heard that you guys got people in your church that are saying there's no resurrection. Man, this is the whole reason I got there. Why do you think for us guys back to our day and age that Easter is our really big holiday? Resurrection Sunday is a whole lot bigger than Christmas. Maybe, maybe in the United States, maybe in the world, they celebrate Christmas as, as a bit, but Easter's the biggie for us. Because if Christ isn't risen from the dead, you know what we are? Pathetic. If we worship a guru, then we might as well be Buddhists. Because Buddha had a whole lot better things to say about life than Christ. Did you just say that? I absolutely did. Christ said, don't love yourself to death. Buddha, psh, just be nice to everybody. Just love everybody. Yeah, you know what? If there's no resurrection, I'll follow Buddha. Now, if that offended you that I just said, wait. The Apostle Paul is about to say the same thing. He says that when Christ rose from the dead, this was no... Like, only I saw him. First Peter saw him. Then the other apostles saw him. Then 500 people saw him. Do you know how many people saw him after he rose from the dead? So either he didn't really die on the cross, and God, or God didn't raise him from the dead. But he did get raised from the dead. And hundreds of people saw him. That's what he was telling them. Continuing. Four. Now he, he switches gears a little bit, but comes back to his original uh, premise. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Now, another doctrinal thing he kind of deals with here, he hints at, and I just want to dip our toe into the water of that. He says, listen, I saw him. I know that he was raised from the dead. And let me tell you something. Me, I'm the least of all of them he's, he's writing to them. But because of the grace that was on me, I worked harder than all the other apostles. But what is he referring to there? Listen, the word grace, charismo in Greek, in the Greek, is a power. It's the understanding that it's not that you are saved by works. Why did Paul labor more than all the other apostles? Because he did worse, and therefore he had to prove to God he was sincere, which is, believe me when I tell you, the thought of too many Christians. No. The Bible says, the Lord Jesus said, to he who is forgiven much, loves much. When you realize how much you've been forgiven, the byproduct is to serve God for the rest of your life. I know what God rescued me, not just from, but forgave me of. I have been forgiven. I, I just, 
crimes against humanity, crimes against people, just the things that I did against God. This is a really funny saying. I think it was uh, a guy named Tony Campolo. He says to his congregation one day, he says, if you knew what a sinner I was, you wouldn't want to talk to me. And then he goes, and if I knew what sinners you were, I wouldn't want to talk to you either. It's not, it's not the grace that's upon you that gives you the ability to work. It's the grace that you've been given that gives you the hunger to serve God. How in the world, Ryan, can you be 20 years in, 25 years into this walk and still every day wake up and grab that word? There's a great, there's a great, um, uh, he's a uh, college professor right now. His name is Jordan Peterson. If you've never heard of him, he's phenomenal. He's, he's, he's wonderful from, from an intelligent life perspective. Um, to say he's a Christian, I, I don't know if I'd call him a Christian, but he has some really good, uh, I, I, I audit some of his college classes and his, uh, um, his I think they're called sermons, what is it? Lectures. lectures. Some of his lectures are amazing. He says that the existential threat that stands two feet behind you should be enough to motivate you to keep moving forward. And there's nothing better than an existential threat, a true and real fear, about two steps behind you to keep you moving forward. So me, what drives me is I know what's back there. I've been there. I'm not going back there. Because every single time I've backslidden, it's a little harder to get back to where I was. And I have a little more scar, a little more scar tissue, a little stiff in different places. I ain't doing that no more. So every day, the Apostle Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God alone. So it's kind of a weird thing here now. Again, back to the doctrinal thing. On one hand, he's saying you have to believe, verb. On the other hand, he's saying you have to receive, noun. You believe that God raised Christ from the dead and believe that God's grace is upon you. And somewhere in that line is what keeps you going forward. Listen, I'm not going to expect you all to meditate on that right now, but I do expect you to file that somewhere in your brain under, let me think about that later, because this is what will save you later. Continuing. Verse 9. Um, nope, verse 11. Here it is. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preached and so you believed. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? This is where we started, guys. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he's raised Christ up, whom he did not raise up, if, in fact, the dead do not rise. Then he says something that has just confused people for 2,500 years. For if the dead do not rise, if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Watch this. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we, have, we are of all men the most pitiable. You hear what he said in verse 19 there, guys? He said, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you believe in Jesus Christ, but not the resurrection, I pity you. That's horrible. You are to be more pitied. That's why I said, listen, if you're going to follow a dead, if you're going to follow a dead Savior, follow Buddha. Man, happy, fat, smiling, you know what I mean? That's, that's all I'm all about, the the fat smiley thing, man. That's, that's me. This is where I want to be. This whole pick up your cross daily, follow after me. Yeah, if Christ isn't risen, yeah, I think I ain't about that. And this is exactly what the Apostle Paul is going to illustrate now, even more so. He said, if all you believe in is Christ, sands risen from the dead, oh my goodness, then you're the most pitiable of all men. 
You following what he's saying here? Here's why, verse 20, continuing. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Guys, Christ was risen from the dead. So too, everybody that dies in Christ will also rise with him. What can't you stare down now? What can't you look in the face of? What do you have to be afraid of? You understand? You can kill me, and all you do is make me better. But if you kill me, and all I do is die, and there's no resurrection, then what am I doing? I better start insulating myself with some better things. Eat and drink, tomorrow we die type of thing. Now, that's no, not, not, not my words. Watch. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. So what he's saying here, guys, is Adam brought death because he bit the fruit in the garden, selling off our souls, basically, the whole world, to the devil, but by man, the man Christ Jesus. If you don't know, there's a doctrine called kenosis. I am not going to go through the whole thing for you now, but according to, um, I'll remember this scripture. I, I never remember the address. I only remember the, the verses. Um, it said that he took upon himself our sins by taking off his godship, putting it aside and living as a man on the earth and doing what we could not do, say no to sin our whole lives. And by doing that, defeated death, thus giving us life. More doctrine. I told you there was a lot of doctrine today, but this is where we are. Now, is that my words? Nope. Look at the very next line. For since by Adam came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ set his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. Please, listen, a lot of doctrine. This is a doctrine of, of how... When Christ returns, we're going to be raptured. Then, the millennial reign, and after a thousand years, the archangel, the archangel Michael is going to take Satan and throw him into the lake and be done with him forever. You understand? There's this whole chain of events that's going to occur, and that's what he goes through. I don't want to go through all that now. If you have questions about it, I'll go through it with you later. I want to stick to the subject we're on. I told you there's a lot of doctrine today. Verse 25, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. That is at what's called the great white throne judgment, which is after the thousand year millennial reign, according to 20th chapter of the book of Revelation. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Please there is another doctrine that he deals with here called the doctrine of preeminence. We don't have to deal with it, but basically it's this. In Psalm 110, I want to say, something like that. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Father literally says to the Son, I will put all your enemies under your foot. And at the end of the age, that's what happens. All rule, all authority, all power are put under Jesus Christ. Here the Apostle Paul says, of course we're not speaking of the Father. Because as soon as all rule and all authority and all power are given to Christ Jesus, what do you think he does with it? He gives it back to the Father, which is the perfect picture of everything that God gives us. Every power, every authority, we just got to keep giving it back to God. What are, we, what are we doing anyway if not serving by God's grace alone? If not serving because of God's grace alone, that's how this whole thing ties together. But again, I don't want to spend too much time there. Let's stay on the resurrection subject. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. God is all in all. Otherwise, ready? Now, here's where he deals with their false doctrine and why. And this also is very confusing to people. We're almost done, guys. Take a deep breath and stay with me. 
Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead, and why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. Please, verse 32. So what was happening here, just like the Mormons, in case you don't know, let me give you some Mormon doctrine. Mormons believe, and they actually, Mormons will, they have in their, um, Mormons are very, very organized religion. They have a genealogy. They take you, you, you get, quote unquote, saved in the Mormon faith, and they immediately start going back to your genes, all your genealogy. And they then will ask you, this is so crazy, and you guys, most of you guys won't believe me, you, you're going to think I'm making fun of the Mormons. I'm not. I'm giving you straight Mormon doctrine, even though it sounds a little bit to me like I'm in a mocking way. I'm not mocking. I'm telling you straight up. They will then ask you to pray to or to somehow contact your dead relatives to ask them if you can save them. And in order for you to save your dead relatives, you are baptized for your dead relatives, but you also then have to start tithing for them. And if you will give enough money over enough period of time, you can get your dead relatives out of Hades. <coughs> was it really? That's great. She said Ancestry.com was founded by two Mormons. Hey, listen, however they want to make money, it's, it's, I think it's a cool thing to find your ancestry. It's, it doesn't in any way in my insinuating is bad. I did that whole, you know, 23 and me thing. What, is that 23 and me, baby? Is that what it was? My mom did it for me. It was no surprise, zero surprise. Was like exactly who I always told I was. You're Ashkenazi Jew, Sicilian. It was like 2% African. Like, where'd that come from? <laughs> you only 50 cent, though, because I saw, I saw your daddy. <laughs> My brother. <laughs> you knew you liked me. <laughs> So what happens is, they had the same thing. Back in the Corinthian church, they were doing these baptisms for the dead. So he says to them, wait a second. If you don't believe in the resurrection, then why are you baptizing people for the dead? What? That, that's a ridiculous thing to do. Now, some people to this day still say, no, that's not exactly what happened at all, that we should still baptize. There are some religious sects like, like the Mormons, who baptize for the dead. But why do we do communion? I'll tell you why we do communion. Because the Lord Jesus did communion, and they did communion in the book of Acts. So thus it becomes a sacrament. Why do we do baptisms? Because the Lord Jesus was baptized, and he taught baptism in, 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 the, in the book of Acts. The way we do our what's called sacraments or our um, traditions, our, what is it? Covenants, you can call it, is if, it's, if the Lord Jesus did it and it appears in the book of Acts, then we adopt it as our own. The dedication we just did, we see them in the book of Acts and we see that the Lord Jesus did it. Thus, it is one of our sacraments, the dedication of our children to the Lord, not necessarily the baptism. And listen, there's nothing wrong with baptizing a kid. I think it's a beautiful thing. It's the same type of dedication. Why, why, you know, why mock what somebody else does? If it's beautiful, it's beautiful. It's not so unbiblical that you go, oh my goodness, it's not like you're, uh, let's not even go there. So you see what he says to them. Watch, continue now. Watch what he says then. Verse 30, start at. And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If in the manner of men I have fought with the beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. You see what he says? He says, what do you, why do you think I'm fearless? Why do you think that, that, that I fought against the men in, in Ephesus without fear? Because if I die, I only get better. If I am not going to get raised from the dead, then I'm going to insulate myself with sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and I'm going to have a party lifestyle because there's no crime. There's nothing to pay. You follow? But the dead do rise. And here's his last encouragement. Now, next week we're going to look at 
listen, when I, I know I say this a lot. Next Sunday, we're going to look at some of the most beautiful, amazing, comforting things about what resurrection body looks like. I encourage you, if you've lost anybody, man, you got to be here next week to see the difference between the seed and the flower is an amazing thing. But this is the last thing the Apostle Paul ends this doctrinal um, dissertation to them. He says to them, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some don't have the knowledge of God. And I speak this to your shame. He said, you hang out with people who tell you there's no resurrection. You hang out with people who have bad doctrine. You let them into your church and you don't correct them because you want to welcome everybody. You want to be user-friendly. You want to be emergent, whatever. He said, shame on you. They're poisoning your people. Some people don't believe in the resurrection of Christ. They're going to hell. Do you understand that? Believing in Jesus is not enough. You have to believe that God raised him from the dead. I say that with the authority of Old Testament. I say it with the authority of New Testament. You can't just believe. You can't just say, oh, Jesus, save me. Wait a second. Let's make sure you have the understanding right. It's confessing with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That saves you. That might be a little weird to some of you guys. This is why I'm so passionate. This is what bothers me so much about some of these mega churches where people can go and come and nobody ever says nothing to them. No pastor ever talks to them. No elder ever confronts them. No deacon ever speaks with them. Well, it's great that there's 100 people a week that are coming forward and, and saying they're giving their lives to Christ. But do they understand what that means? What about the hundreds that are at these churches? Sometimes thousands. I mean, there's that dude... Um, what, what, what's he's got, like 70,000 people? 70,000. His church is a stadium. What's his name? Olstein. And they don't talk about blood, and they don't talk about the cross. And they, It's just God, man. It's God, your best life ever today, man. Like, wait a second. If you don't talk about death to self, if you don't talk about resurrection, man, you're condemning people. Oh, that's not true. I have plenty of friends that got saved there. Listen, I got saved at a church where the pastor fell into sexual sin some years later. It's not like it doesn't, it's not like the word of God's not going forward in some places. But what about the people that aren't getting it? This is what scares me. You know, um, crazy, I'm quoting a guy who just fell. Uh, uh, James McDonald, one of my favorite preachers, I went to a service and he said to me, he said to me while he was preaching in the congregation, I always say that, he said to me, he was speaking to me, forget about everybody else there. If people aren't leaving your church saying, that's a hard saying, who can know it? Then you don't have a ministry like Jesus Christ. Thus you better really, really think about what you're doing. God can cut the population of your church in half in one week and be twice as happy with you. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And the last thing I'm going to say to you guys, if you don't confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, and you don't believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you ain't saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for the, uh, the depth of today's service, God, the uh, amazing way that the Apostle Paul brought together, Old and New Testament, the amazing way that he gave us the, the true foundation of the gospel, the good news. God, may that sink deep into our hearts. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters that are here, that this, this word would sink deep into their heart and would be the foundation, the very bedrock of their faith, never, ever wavering, never shifting, but uh, inciting deep thought, inciting important debate within one's own self. God, that the, uh, the belief in God <laughs> is something people would take so seriously and never make light of it. Love you, Lord Jesus, and thank you for your word. Bless your people. In Christ's name, amen. Amen, amen. amen.